Hey guys, what's up? Zombie here. Welcome to Evil Zombies Lair, episode 45. Today we do have a special guest. I'll get into that in just a second. Um, we're going to go over several things today. First thing we're going to go over is kind of multimedia news, what's happening with that. Uh, then the anime recommendation of the week. And then we're going to go into the main topic. We're going to skip the tech stuff today. We're going to introduce, and I'm going to tell you about um, a campaign set of tools that was made for D&D by uh, Jaren, okay, Jaren R.M. Johnson who's our guest on the podcast today. So, uh, why don't you say hi? Hey guys, what's going on? Uh, my name is Jaren. Uh, I'm super stoked to be a part here with uh, Zombies uh, Podcast. I'm really uh, excited to talk to you guys about what I got going on. Yeah, I'm really excited to kind of share with you and for him to talk about what's what he's been creating here because it's a lot of fun and I think you guys are going to enjoy it if you like D&D at all. <laughs> so... Um, Let's see. So also, I wanted to mention to you guys that the podcast, if you're uh, watch, if you're listening to it in the audio segment, you can listen to it on any kind of podcatcher that you have on your phone or on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, any of those. But if you um, want to check out all the previously recorded episodes and all that, there's a video segment of them too on youtube.com slash evilzombie. Let's move on to kind of just personal updates, what's been going on in life. Uh, I've been running a couple of D&D campaigns actually with family, friends, all that. Um, and going through the Lost Mine of Fandelver with family, they've actually been liking that. Have you tried that one out? Uh, so I actually haven't, but it's on my list. Uh, most of what I've done has been, you know, homebrew. Uh, but I've really wanted to get into the modules, and that's really high on my list. That one's a pretty good one just for, like, if you want a short one for a few levels, and it's easy to jump into because it already has you in the middle of a mission. Like, basically, yeah, you've I mean, been hired for something, and you're doing it. <laughs> it sounds really awesome. Yeah, so far, I've been enjoying that one. It's been pretty good for the family. And then just kind of homebrew stuff for everything else. Because it just seems a little more free. Because <laughs> nothing ever goes according to plan. All right, has everything, has everything uh, going good with you for um, kind of running mission, running campaigns? Have you been DMing a bit or no? Yeah, uh, I, I, we took a break from a lot of the campaigns that we typically run for the Kickstarter. Um, just because it's, it's just so much. Uh, but tomorrow, actually, uh, so that'll be uh, Monday, June 3rd, uh, we're doing a 24-hour live stream. So it's going to be three different campaigns back-to-back, -back, and they're all going to be set in the, the world of Merca, which I'm sure we're going to talk about here in a few minutes. Uh, uh -huh. But that is going to be a blast. Um, me and a, a couple of my buddies, we're each going to take turns DMing in different sections uh, of the world. It's going to be really awesome. Well, wow, that's going to be a lot of fun, then. Yeah, other than that, I, I've DM'd a couple of games of uh, Pathfinder 2nd Edition, which I'm really, really into. Uh, and then uh, we just wrapped up a Homebrew 5e campaign maybe two, three weeks ago, which was also a lot of fun. Oh, nice. How long did that campaign take to go through? Uh, it, it was just kind of like a... It was meant to be a one-shot, but uh, a lot of the people that were attending were like, oh, this is really fun, let's keep going. So I had to keep you know, pulling ideas out of nowhere, and uh, we, we just kept it going. I think it lasted maybe eight weeks before we were finally able to wrap it up. But I mean, from a, from a one shot, it was designed to just be like a one night thing. Uh, it was a lot of fun. It lasted a lot longer than we expected. Oh, that's always good then. At least everyone had fun, you know? Main point of the game. <laughs> yeah, right. Yep. We'll jump into um, the next section, the kind of multimedia news. Just want to tell everyone a little bit about um, like the Godzilla movie. Big fan of it. Of it. The movie's finally out. Don't want to really give away any spoilers, but it seems to really be crushing it. And everyone seems to really love it. All the critics hate it. And all the fans love it, so there's that. The critics are always going to hate everything that comes out that is not artistic. At least more or less. And then, um, just for you guys, Dragon Ball Super also released a new issue of the manga. And I'm not going to really give away any spoilers, but they are really giving some more depth to Majin Buu. And we're finally seeing him more than just happy childlike character that has immense power. And now he has more immense power and a little more... Um, a little more put into the character for him. So a little character building went on with the manga. And it's a welcome change. Uh, I won't tell you anything else that's happening with it. Because you're able to read it for free on the Viz website. Or on the... Oh, what was it? It's not Viz. Do you remember what, what company is running Dragon Ball in America? Uh, to be honest with you, man. That's that's out of my pay grade. I wouldn't know. <laughs> Sorry. It's, it's not Toei Animation. Ah, well, they can find it. They just type Dragon Ball Super. Either way. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> oh. That's it for that part. Next is the anime recommendation of the week. So, I recommend this time Gunbuster, because it's a, it's a classic one. I think that one's from Gainax, actually. And 
it's a lot of fun. It's a very short series for the first one, about five episodes. It feels a lot longer because it has a lot of information packed into it, and it really pulls through uh, with Einstein's theory of relativity and how time passes based on space and how fast you go. It has really sound theories based on, uh, or really sound practices and writing based on that theory, and it's a lot of fun. Those giant robot fights with aliens. So you really can't miss out on that one. It's, it's a lot of fun. It's old. If you haven't seen it yet, you probably need to. It's a good one. Go check that one out. It's called Gunbuster. If you want to see what other anime I've seen, if you're curious about the list and you want to see if there's any that you haven't caught yet, go to myanimelist.net slash profile slash evilzombie123. Okay, guys, moving on to the main topic. Uh, I cut out some other stuff so that we can just spend a little more time in this because this is going to be fun and I think you guys are going to enjoy it. So first, we're going to go into this. So Monsters of Murka is um, Dungeons and Dragons 5e. It's not a campaign. It's more of a tool set. Would you say that's correct? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a campaign setting. So it's, it's a world in which you can create your own stories. It comes with adventures. So, you know, if, if you're the kind of guy who uh, wants to run purely based on modules, we've got adventures for level from 1 to 10. But uh, it's also just, you know, monsters, dungeons, uh, geographic locations, all stylized as a high fantasy parody of the United States. Which actually had beautiful artwork and a lot of fun humor throughout it as I read, the, as I read what you sent me for it. So that actually seems like it's going to be a lot of fun to add into campaigns possibly. And have you, had, have you tried adding into regular D&D uh, &D campaigns or have you normally tried to mold worlds around the setting? Uh, so we have done a couple of games that were based purely within the setting, trying to run uh, as much setting-specific content as we could. I was actually uh, on another podcast, uh, Nerdy People Play D&D, &D, where I had sent uh, Josh, uh, who is uh, from Sydney, Australia, I had sent him uh, the same document that I sent you, and he created his own world. You know, he, he didn't want to use anything that was in the book, so he was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the themes of your world, uh, and I'm going to make my own creatures and monsters. Some of the stuff that he made I liked so much, you know, I wanted to put it in the book, so uh, some of the stuff that he made you can find in the uh, full version of the book once the campaign is over. Oh, that sounds fun. Um, when the community loves it and then really just wants to get involved and add into it, it just blasts off, right? Yeah, man, it, it's been really exciting to just see other people uh, uh, just start Twitter threads and say, like, oh, what if you did this, and what if we did this, and... Sometimes it's it's a new and fresh idea. Sometimes it's stuff that we've already kind of written a little bit about, and we're like, uh, just wait and see what we've done, which is it's just <laughs> as fun. That seems like it's going to be a lot of fun for everyone, and I'm happy that people are really getting into it because I, as I've been kind of watching your posts on it, um, there's been some pretty good support for it as I've seen. Yeah, yeah, on on Twitter, uh, we've gotten a lot of people that are just all about this idea. I think it's mm -hmm. it's a really good place for people to kind of express their ideas and opinions and I think a lot of people look to Dungeons and Dragons to do that and this gives them kind of a way to explore some of those real world uh, things in a way that's a little bit removed from reality. I think it makes it a little bit more palatable for them. Mm -hmm. And it's just kind of a good place for them to be able to fit into this world and have a basic understanding of how they can mold it to what they want is nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So who would you say kind of the target audience for this specifically is? Did you have one or just want to kind of make it for fun? Did you have any kind of certain group in, uh, in mind with this? That's actually a really good question. I'm super glad you asked it. Um, this is one of those situations where uh, it was, it, it began as, as uh, a lot simpler of an idea. And uh, we, we can talk about that in a few minutes. But the original idea was just, you know, a couple of monsters that were just kind of like little parody monsters it grew a lot from that. Uh, but we stuck with this uh, this idea of kind of like making fun of uh, some of the politics and like doing some like Donald Trump art. We stuck with that for the marketing, which has actually given, I think it's sent a little bit of the wrong message. I think a lot of people think that it's a, a very liberal left-wing uh, political book. And that's that's not, what, that's really not what I wanted to convey with it. Uh, you know, there's there's political figures from both sides, but also it's, it's not just political satire. Uh, you know, we do, tons of celebrities uh for example the campaigns that we're doing tomorrow for the live stream uh i'm playing tom a, a high fantasy parody of tom cruise uh a friend of mine she's going to play betty white and we're going to explore hollywoods which you know our high fantasy parody of hollywood like it's it's everything we wanted to do all of the united states pop culture it just so happened that you know politics are uh, are a little bit of what's kind of relevant 
and you know dumb me i thought oh this will be controversial and it'll make people talk about it and it it has spun wildly out of control uh but oh, yeah. in, in, in a good way so yeah the target audience is anyone who who wants to kind of get a kick out of poking fun at some of the pop culture that we experience in the united states Yes, I mean, I can understand that, how some people, if they don't actually open the book and read it, then they might look at it as, oh, it's trying to make fun of certain people. But once they actually read it, I think they're going to understand, oh, this is really funny, and it's just kind of having having at it at everybody. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got it. <laughs> but once they understand it's a parody and it's about good sense of humor, then people are going to open up to it a lot. Yeah, I think that's a big thing, too, is, you know, it's it's not meant to be a political statement. I'm just here to make people laugh, man. I, I'm not here to, to send this really powerful message or anything. I just want to make jokes. That's all I'm interested in. Make people laugh, have fun. That's what it's about. Oh, yeah. After reading, like, the first couple of pages, you say that very clearly. And, it, and after that, it was just all fun. So you did get the point across in the messages. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I'm glad. <laughs> okay. So on to some of the questions. Um... I read in the beginning of it, it was kind of dedicated to Stan Lee. How has Stan Lee kind of influenced your style of creating this campaign? And was he a big influence in it? Just kind of his yeah, works? Absolutely, man. Uh, Stan has always just been all about, uh, one, making heroes that are relatable, right? And in a world that's almost a, a literal, uh, parodical uh, translation of our real world, it's it's great to, to try and aspire to find a relatable or realistic hero in that world. Mm -hmm. and I like the way he builds worlds. Uh, a friend of mine uh, once told me about this uh, really awesome Stan Lee quote where he said, uh, you know, if if, uh, if you can't find a comic book world that you like, or if you're not a huge fan of the world that you live in, build your own, you know, make your own world. Uh, and that, I, it really influences me in all of my creative works. Um, with, with the unfortunate uh, uh, passing of Stan Lee, I really thought it would be uh, a, a strong message for me, something I wanted to do to dedicate the book to him. That's very nice, and that's also probably appreciated by a lot of people who are going to um, remember him with, when they open up that and then to see that. They'll probably see just several things that remind them of how he did world building and how he kind of poured his soul into things to kind of make it feel relatable, like you said. Yeah, he was a cool guy like that. Yeah, totally agreed, man. Okay, so next question. Um, what has been some of the best and worst criticism that really helped you with the creation of Monsters of Mirka? Uh, that is a great question, too. Um, a lot of people had come after it and said, you know, uh, you're you're only doing uh, Donald Trump, and that, that's all you're, you're trying to make fun of, because, you know, again, we, we tried to kind of lead with that. Uh, and so in response to that, you know, a lot of people were saying things like, well, what about this person? What about that person? Which led to uh, some of, uh, almost like out of spite, uh, my my brother who works with me on this project and I got together and said, uh, well, fine, who, who can we parody on the other side to just shut these people up and make them happy and see that this book can be for them too? Uh, and so we wound up doing, uh, uh, it's, it's, we're still kind of working uh, on it, but it's like Hillary Clinton as a queen of the lizard people which kind of like plays onto that whole parody of her and everything. Uh, we also have Mark Zuckerberg as one of the lizard people. So you you get to see some of the other uh, folks. And I, I think those criticisms, uh, they, they were right to assume that, right? I mean, they only know what I show them. And I think it, it was definitely something that I learned a lot by leading with that, that, you know, I, I should have uh, should have spread it out a little bit more. I should have uh, leveled the playing field a little bit. Uh, yeah, because um, like the first impressions that people just get from only looking at the artwork at first and not reading into it yet. Right, right. Yeah, so that those are, those have been some criticisms that have helped with uh, with just new stuff that we've made. Uh, and then also, um, I've been talking to a lot of people about representation and uh, diversity, uh, which is really really important in a book that is supposed to be analogous to the real world. Right, I want to make sure that. I, I try to represent uh, all of the, the groups that I can, which has kind of led me to learn a lot about other things uh, and about other cultures that I'm just not a part of. I'm, I'm from small town Ohio, so we really lack in that department. So it's been a blast to learn about that stuff, too. Oh, yeah, I bet it has. And let's see. Uh, next question, man. I'm sorry, we're just kind of breezing through a lot of it. <laughs> but getting good answers. Um, is there a story behind the, I was looking at the, the icon you made, the, 
Pendusius icon with looked kind of like the blue cross icon with the pen going through it. That actually looked really yeah. interesting. And then you had kind of the message how uh, uh, kind of describing it a little bit. But can you give me a little more depth on that? Like, what did that mean to you? Kind of a little backstory behind that. Yeah, absolutely, man. Uh, so I came up with that a couple of years ago. I was working on this comic book um, with some colleagues that I've known for years and years. Uh, and the comic book was uh, a little autobiographical, but, you know, I removed a lot of the details because I want it to be relatable to people. And it's about this guy who's kind of venturing out into the world. He's finding himself. He's dealing with some things like depression and stuff like that. And uh, in in writing that, I was able to kind of explore a lot of the things that I was going through, but from the creative writing lens. It added a layer of separation where we're writing about it kind of helped me deal with it. And I realized that, you know, writing and, and creating can have this uh, really powerful kind of healing effect. Uh, being creative can can give you a little bit of a reprieve from some of the negativity that, that you might deal with in real life. And I just love the idea of like, you know, a, a healing through creativity idea. So, you know, the, the, the symbol is based on the Caduceus, uh, which was the, the Hermes staff. Hermes was the, uh, the god of uh, messages, actually. So the idea is uh, it's messages. It, it's like you said, the, the blue cross, blue shield, the idea of healing and that sort of thing. So it's all about writing a healing message, kind of tying all of that symbolism together. Okay, that's really nice, actually, because um, it's really true. Um, any, when you really find a medium that you want to express yourself with, and writing is one of the best ways you can do that, um, even like songwriting or things like that, it's like a good way kind of for you just to get what's inside, outside, when you don't know how otherwise, right? Yeah, totally agree. And that also played a huge part in Monsters of America because, you know, a lot of people... Uh, they come to the game table, and that's that's their reprieve, and that that's being creative. Even if you're just playing as a player, I mean, you're thinking of the creative solutions. You're being your character, and so I wanted to to kind of use this parody book as a way to kind of like you know uh, make light of some of the some of the real stuff that's going on in the world, some of the stuff that people really struggle with, uh, and allow them to kind of play in that as opposed to feeling the the negativity. From it. Nice, very nice. Yeah, this was, it's a really great way for people to do that. Um, all right, I just lost where I was on it because my screen went off. <laughs> for everyone that's watching or listening, I have all the notes up on my phone screen, so sorry that it went off. Okay, so did you have any um, kind of weapons or armor or items like that that you actually had planned for this, uh, for this module, for the supplement? Um, or are you keeping it mostly to creatures and settings? Did you have any kind of... Because you mentioned a few different kinds of items that would be funny to add in. Did you have any kind of index that you were going to include in the full version? Yeah, yeah, we're absolutely working on adding some of the items and stuff. Um, the, the book was originally designed just as a monster manual. I just wanted to do, you know, a couple of funny monsters. Um, and then I thought, well, these monsters need a lair, and that expanded. Uh, and now we're, we're working on a lot of fun magic items. Uh, things like, a, you know, tinfoil hat as a, as an armor that protects against psychic damage i mean there's a, there's a lot of fun stuff that you can do with that um my, my brother workshops this really cool sword called the sword of truth uh that, that kind of represents truth and justice there's, there's a lot of really really fun stuff i know he's also workshopping uh the axe that george washington used to chop down the cherry tree as uh, as its own kind of like legendary magic weapon so he, he's we're doing a lot of fun uh, equipment and armor and stuff like that i think i think that's almost necessary for a campaign setting where you want to create a really immersive world. You want to have everything from monsters to locations to equipment that players can really use to immerse themselves in that world. Yeah, and then if it's things that kind of just uh, po poke humor at and poke fun at uh, real-world paranoia or suspicions and things like that, and it just happens to be something fun in this world, it's just all the more fun. <laughs> exactly, yeah. We've had a lot of fun recently uh, creating some joke spells uh, that people have been circulating on Twitter. I think people are really having a lot of fun with those spells. Uh, one of one of the spells that we did was uh, Cure Butt Hurt, uh, which is just kind of, I mean, uh, we made these little spell cards that people can use as reaction images online. You know, someone's complaining about something, you just take the like, Cure Butt Hurt spell as though you were casting it. Uh, and the spells like that are definitely going to make their way into the book. They have, you know, a practical use, but also it's just kind of a, a funny one-off joke sort of thing. That's always fun, and it's definitely a good way to get a good chuckle to the, at the table when everyone's playing. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because at the end of the day, D&D is definitely a game, and it's all meant for fun. 
Yeah, exactly. You just you you're coming here to have fun. Some tables, I mean, a, a lot of tables, they they'll do things like, uh, you know, well, you guys want to go to a store, and they say yeah, and the DM says uh, okay, well, there's a Schmall Mart over there, you know, and they they'll make these real world references and plugs, and so this is kind of a a whole setting that's nothing but those just real world puns after puns. That's fun. That um, real world pun locations like stores reminds me kind of of Adventure Zone and. All the wonders of fantasy Costco. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, I was actually just talking to uh, one of the the uh, lady Maddie is joining us to play Betty White tomorrow, and she loves Adventure Zone. I've actually never listened, so that's going on my list now. She was highly recommending it. Oh yeah, there's two of them that I've been working through a lot: Adventure Zone and Make Believe Heroes. Absolutely love them. A lot of fun. Hey, so. The next one, next question. Um, what is the best thing about Monsters of Merc, in your opinion? What's the one, like the core aspect of it that you really want to push to people because it's just the best to you? Uh, I really want to push the idea that uh, you know, in parody and in comedy, uh, nothing is sacred. You know, I'm I'm here to to poke fun at just about everything that I can and and really use comedy uh, and, and use comedy with everything that I can to kind of bring everyone together. I think I think when you create an environment where everyone feels a little comfortable with, uh, you know, making light of things that, that are hardships for them or making light about uh, the way that other people might see them, when you take, uh, so for example, you know, uh, I was bullied a lot in school, but when I took the way that I was bullied and then I just kind of owned it and I made it my joke that I used, it was a great way for me to combat against that. Uh, and I think that that's really applicable in today's world. You know, when we take some of the hard stuff that we're dealing with and we can we can laugh at it, uh, that just completely declaws the situation. It makes it so much easier. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think for me, that's that's the biggest selling point. That's the most important thing I want to send home with Monsters of Merca is that, you know, laughter is the best medicine. D&D is about having fun uh, and feeling comfortable in your own skin. And that's that's really what I want people, excuse me, to do with Monsters of Merca. Yeah, so really just pushing that whole spirit of lightheartedness and just have a good time no matter what the situation is. Try and find a good side to it. Yeah, exactly. Very nice. That's a good message for people. All right, so out of all the monsters, you said it was kind of a monster manual they were making for this world at first, so that was your main mindset for it, and there are a lot of fun monsters in it. Um, what is kind of the most fun and interesting one that you created that just really was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. I can't wait to see people's reaction to it. Because uh, you know there's that one monster that you loved making and you're so excited to see what people think. Yeah. Of. So it was actually the first one that I did. was the, It was the Trumplins, which are just Trump goblins. You know, most of the monsters in the book are, uh, you know, this base D&D &D 5e monster plus Trump. And then you just kind of mash them together. So the Trumplins are obviously Trump and goblins. Uh, and I just, I loved this symbolism of these you know, just a bunch of like goofy uh, goblin kind of characters all running around and, and talking these like really uh, high pitched kind of gravelly voices and bumbling over one another. There's this beautiful piece of art that uh, one of our artists made that's a Trumplin feast. Uh, and I, when I work with artists, you know, it's important to me that they have fun doing it. So I said, hey, man, I, I need a full splash page art of Trumplins uh, and I really want you to have fun with it. Do, do whatever you think is fun. And the Trumplin Feast is what he came up with, and he just absolutely killed it. With, I mean, they're arguing, and they're throwing food at each other, and they're gnawing on bones, and they're drinking, and it's, it's just absolute chaos. And I think that's really what I wanted uh, those characters to represent, is, is just a, like a, a whole horde of just tiny chaotic monsters. It's so much fun to look at. That's going to be a lot of fun to hear about people, to hear what people do with those creatures, because I can imagine they're going through a dungeon, they open the door, and they just see this big sprawling combative dinner table for some reason that's the first yeah. thing that pops into my mind after seeing that it just seemed wonderful <laughs> <laughs> i'm glad you liked it oh yeah and um i actually missed this one um so what was the your favorite piece of artwork there's a lot of artwork in this done by several different artists who are all very talented and do you have any that just kind of was like wow that's really cool <laughs> Yeah, uh, so I, I did, I really liked the splash page that I mentioned, but I think my favorite piece uh, was a piece, uh, I'm trying to remember, I think it was Pierre-Eric Sorel is the one who did this piece, but it's this beautiful piece of the Washington Monument. 
Uh, we actually, it, it's just a, a background piece that's used um, on, in one of the earlier pages, but it's become one of the real centerpieces of the marketing campaign because I just, I really fell in love with this picture, but it's this nice market square uh, with people all kind of walking around and these really beautiful medieval uh, French style buildings. And then in the, in the center of it, you can see this towering version of the Washington Monument. There are some streamers going around that's, that are red, white, and blue. I just think it really authentically captures the idea of what, you know, the United States or uh, Washington, D.C., in, in our book, it's Washtown, what that would look like if it were this medieval city and, and what that would feel like just walking down that street. I absolutely fell in love with that piece. Yeah, that was really a nice, actually, that was a really nice piece of art. I was admiring a lot of the pictures and just everything that, it looked like they put into it. It was a lot of fun. So that that's actually a really cool way to look at it. Yeah, thanks, man. After this, I'm going to go examine that again because that's, that's, I'm going to go look at it with new eyes now. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, our, our book actually has a press release, and it's one of the images that uh, people are encouraged to use in the press release. So if anyone wants to see a you know, a high-res, full version of that, they can check out the press kit. It's, it's included in that, and it looks so good. Well, that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> awesome. Will do. And... Um... So another question, are there any kind of sequels or expansions planned after the full release is done? Uh, so that's a really good question. We have some stretch goals to cover different cities. Uh, what I would really like to do is have, you know, cities with mapped locations and dungeons and do all of the major cities that are in that map. Everything from, you know, uh, Seattle all the way over to uh, Idolando. Idolando is a fun one, uh, you know, a parody of Orlando where, People worship this uh, rat god, uh, kind of a spoof on Mickey Mouse, which is a lot of fun. So I would really like to do expansions where I can, you know, do an entire book just on uh, a couple of these cities at a time and really give them the attention and the level of detail that they that they deserve. That sounds like a lot of fun. And people can probably in the future connect one campaign to the next one in, within this world. Which is probably gonna be exactly, a yeah. Yeah, and then one of the other things that we're including uh, is... Uh, a tool set for people to make their own hometowns as cities in Merca. So, you know, they could, they could start in their own town and then travel all over the, this fictional version of the United States, which lets people simulate some of their own, like, uh, you know, I had a buddy of mine who, when I showed it to them, uh, them they said, uh, wow, I really want to, I just went on this road trip across country and I would really like to do that as a D and D campaign. Hmm. And just go through some of the wacky stuff that we did and i was like that's awesome you know relate this real world experience that you had to this dungeons and dragons campaign set Actually, so yeah, I, I think there's just there's so much fun to do with it yeah trips across america and if uh, fans can just kind of give you stuff from across the country and you can kind of just transform it into this world that'd be fantastic a great way to keep it going for a long time like everything from the world's biggest ball of yarn to the biggest thermometer in the world in baker one of the hottest cities i've ever been in <laughs> Yeah. Oh, so there's a lot of fun things that could probably happen from that in the future. All right. So I had a little section here at the end of uh, the main section, so you can kind of just do all your pl all plug in all your info for it. So you can talk about anything you want from different campaigns you want to advertise here, um, your Kickstarter, any kind of social media you want to push out to people, um, oh, all your yeah. projects, all that stuff. Yeah, by all means, man. Uh, so uh, obviously our, our Kickstarter campaign is what I really i am here to talk about. Uh, if you just go to monstersofmurka.com, that's M-U-R-K-A, it'll take you to the campaign page. Uh, if you want to check that out, and even if it's uh, not something that you feel like you can financially support, just tell your friends about it. I mean, you never know. One of your friends might really like it. Um, I also want to mention uh, Eldritch Foundry is another Kickstarter campaign that's going on right now that's very cool where uh, it's, a, it's basically a tool set to create your own custom minis for D&D. &D. Um, I think that's a great idea. I'm all about that idea. So that's a good one to check out. Uh, if you guys want to follow me, if you're interested in what I'm doing or you want to check out Monsters of Merca, uh, I'm on Twitter and Facebook uh, and YouTube uh, as slash Jaron R.M. Johnson for all those platforms. So Twitter slash Jaron R.M. Johnson. That's where you can find me. Uh, and if you guys want to reach out to me, uh, you know, I'd love to connect with you. I'd love to talk about your ideas for Monsters of America or any, I, I, I have a lot of people tell me like, oh, I've, I've kind of done this already. Here's what we did. I love hearing those stories. Uh, so yeah, guys, feel free to reach out to me. I'd love to connect with you. Awesome. And all of the, all of the info guys is going to be in the description below also. So you can find the links uh, down there. So link to the Kickstarter, to the main page, all that stuff. And 
Also, I read that you had a mailing list for people who uh, wanted to get kind of updates on this, so I'll include the link to that in the description if that's okay with you. Yeah, I'd love that. Awesome. So that will bring us to the end of our podcast. So I'm just going to go over a couple of things. So guys, thank you all for watching and really do check this out because it's a lot of fun. And if you're not playing D&D, &D, then shame on you. Go have some fun. <laughs> you can buy a dice on eBay from China. You can buy a set of polyhedral dice for, for $1, literally free shipping. You have nothing to lose from this investment. <laughs> yeah. So go check it out. You'll enjoy it. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast, uh, I, give me a rating based on what you think I did. If you think I did great, give me a decent review or give me that rating. If you think I did terrible, let me know. Scream at me. I enjoy hearing from you anyways. It gives me life. I, I, that's my supplement there. <laughs> <laughs> so, And if you have any questions, guys, email me at evilzombie at protonmail.com. I check that several times a day, all the time. So see you guys later. Thank you for watching so much. Have a good one and bye.